co-hosting um, with SME for Labour. My name is Joe Shipley and I lead um, the Public Affairs team at Kex CNC, which is a global communications advisory firm. At both party conferences, we're conducting opinion research to find out what voters are really talking about at this time of uh, immense change. Um, when we started this project, we imagined we'd be talking about attitudes to business. Um, obviously, since we started, uh, we've had a new Prime Minister and we've had a new monarch. And so voters want to talk about lots of different things as part of those sessions. Um, we've also, um, uh, when we conducted the groups two weeks ago, we were also having a conversation during a period, obviously, of national mourning. Um, what that meant was the focus group participants were talking at a time when there wasn't actually a lot of politics on the TV, unlike now, which meant we got to have a few interesting conversations where things weren't quite caught up in the day to day. Um, the groups we, we carried out um, were in Bury North and Reading West, and my colleague James Hallam will talk a little bit about um, uh, the voters we spoke to in a minute. And, um, and we're really lucky to be joined today by a fantastic panel um, who will be analysing the findings for us, part of talk, talk, taking part in the conversation and talking about their experiences of, of listening to voters and, 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 and where they're coming from. So we're joined by uh, Ruba Hook. Um, uh, the MP for Ealing Central and Acton. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Councillor Shabir Pandor, who's the leader of Kirkby's Council. Um, uh, Joe Mays from Bloomberg and uh, Christian May, the Labour MP for uh, Bury South. Um, I thought it was good. We should give a round of applause for that. Good. Um, and we're also jo joined by my colleague James Hallam, as I said, who conducted the focus groups for us today. So, James. Do you want to just tell us a bit about who we spoke to and why, and then we can get into um, the th go through the three videos of the conversations and start the com conversation from there. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, so we conducted the focus groups, as Joe said, in Bury North um, and in Reading West, um, and these are two um, marginal seats and top targets for Labour in the next election. Um, Bury North is the most marginal seat in the country. It was won in 2019 by the Tories um, by just 100 votes. Um, Reading West, which is Alex Sharma's seat, requires a swing of about um, 4.5 points, so um, absolutely sort of one of the top targets in, in the south of England. Now these deliberately weren't red wall or blue wall seats, um, and what we wanted um, to explore was the views of those traditional marginal seats um, and understand really where voters um, are coming out there. Both these seats have changed hands quite a lot over the last 40 years. Um, and to be honest, it's just as important to be winning these seats as it is to be winning back um, Bolsover or Sedgefield. In terms of the, the voters that we talked to, um, everyone in these focus groups, and you'll see this, this in the videos, um, voted Conservative in 2019. Um, and all of them are kind of undecided as to who they'll vote for this time round. So these are exactly the sorts of votes that effectively count double from a Labour perspective and in an election campaign, and the party really needs to be winning in these kinds of seats um, to be uh, winning the next election. Great, so we've got um, three sections of the videos we're going to show. We've got one um, with voters talking about how they're seeing things right now and their attitudes to the current government. We're, we're going to have a brief conversation about perceptions of Labour and Labour leadership, and then we're going to talk some policy, about some policy issues at the end that are related to business, so SMEs, climate change, and some other standard of living issues as well as, as, as energy prices. So James, do you want to introduce the first video and then we'll go through it after that? Yeah, so um, the first thing to say about the state of the nation's mood at the moment is it's pretty bleak. I mean, I've been doing focus groups for 14 or 15 years, and I think the very groups uh, the Bay Group was probably the most downbeat focus group I've done at any point in that time, including during the 2008 recession um, and also uh, back in the pandemic. Um, now, of course, a big reason for that is the financial concerns that people are experiencing um, at the moment. Um, but I think, as you'll see in these, in these groups, um, there's also a sense that um, it's broader than that. So it's not just a cost of living crisis, it's really a standards of living crisis. And the things that people point to are low levels of uh, decent public services, they talk about NHS waiting lists, they talk about um, worrying about care for elderly relatives and things like that. So these are issues that can't necessarily be solved um, by um, controlling inflation or interest rates. Um, so let's have a look and see what the first video is. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm not 
places I think we're finding how to be. Yeah, I think it will struggle at the moment in many areas. But in place with the total energy and prices and cost of living and things, so about the place at the moment. Yeah, yeah, drop yeah. off. I think it's probably the worst we've ever been dealing with for a long time, to be honest with you. What does the country feel like? What's the mood of the country like at the moment? Same shit. Depressive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm disappointed. I think everyone feels a bit like disappointed in how we've been led astray. Feels like it's crumbling. Oh, I've got historically very leader, which I'm against that, but I've got no other no experience of myself so far. Yeah. to see what she's going to do. Okay. I just put on down to an unknown quantity. I've got an unknown quantity. Unknown quantity, brilliant. Time will tell. Great. I feel like she's got a lot of positivity. It's just off from what she's been saying that she can try and help what's going on here at the moment. And up until now, she's been a bit faceless, if you know what I mean. So you know the name, but you don't know the person. A bit more promising than Boris. I feel like already she's come in and she's trying to sort out things which still did catch the energy price increase from October. Um, but I'm a bit bland. I think for the first time at the dispatch, dispatch box, I think it's now that the exact same three colours, I think she came across quite strong actually. I'm hoping that the new Prime Minister might be able to be a bit better than Boris was. Yeah, I'm a bit stuck at the seat at the moment. There's nothing happening. She hasn't a chance for it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. She literally should have been kind of and died. So she's trying to be thrown in the deep end. Yeah. I think a little bit. I feel like it's very fresh. I would have liked to have had an intro. I don't know if she's expected to tackle energy prices, fuel, the stock market. Yeah, I think she's going to have to tackle straight away. Yeah, I think she's going to have to tackle straight away. Yeah, I think she's going to have to tackle straight away. Yeah, I think she's going to have to tackle straight away. Yeah, I think she's going to have to tackle straight away. Yeah, I think she's going to have to tackle straight away. Yeah, I think she's going to have to tackle straight away. Yeah, I think she's going to have to tackle straight away. Yeah, I think she's going to have to tackle straight away. Yeah, I think she's going to have to tackle straight away. Yeah, I think she's going to have to tackle straight away. Yeah, I think she's going to have to tackle straight away. Yeah, I think she's going to have to tackle straight away. Sort of short term now, that seems to be a bit. Yes, but it got two years to put it around. I think it's quite guaranteed. Maybe yeah. the neighbour is coming yeah. in. Um, okay, so um, we've seen their uh, discussions about both the state of the nation and also um, views on the new government. Um, and, and what I think is fascinating, despite the really dire views that people have on the state of the nation, is that they are giving the new government a bit of time. Um, to define themselves. So Liz Truss is not particularly well known, um, but from her perspective, the good news is she's not especially tied to Boris Johnson, and she's not really tarnished by her own record in government. So there is this opportunity um, for Liz Truss to actually set out what her agenda is, and I think obviously we've seen that in the last three days, um, the direction that she's, she's going to be looking to take. Um, the final thing I'd say on this is um, that what voters also want is her to deliver. Um, you could almost imagine her having done the focus groups around um, that word deliver. It came up time and time again um, in, in our discussions. But ultimately, she is going to be judged on whether she makes a difference to people's lives. Great. So I wonder if we could start, Christian, with you, because you're just next door um, um, in Bury South. James mentioned just how negative people were feeling. And as he said, it's the worst he's ever heard groups, including during COVID and the financial crisis. Is that what you're hearing in Bury? Is it the same conversation you're hearing? Um, it is, and I had a quite unusual experience because I, I actually recognise a couple of people from the, uh, the sample there. Uh, so through the doors I've knocked on, uh, I, I think we, it's been disturbing because it's just the general lack of hope. Uh, you know, it's, it's got to argue with the darkest time that I remember knocking on doors going back to what, 2003. Uh, so the concerns about cost of living, but I, I think like James was saying, it's the actual standard of living, you know, not being able to access a GP service, not being able to access dentistry, not being able to access any decent public services. And for a trust to be able to come in and almost do a, a Johnsonian uh, approach of, it's not me, Gov, you know, I've only been in government for 10 years, um, it's someone else's fault. You know, I, I think we can't underestimate Conservatives' ability to try to rebrand themselves. The difference we've got now is that rebranding is thoroughly ideological. It, it is free marketeerism to the core, and we only needed to look to, uh, to the budget, non-budget this week, as to where the government's priorities are. It's not public services, it's not me or you, you know, but ultimately not on our side. Um, so, you know, it's you know, it's, you know, incumbent on, on all of us to have those conversations and say, well, actually, you know, if you want to be able to have your doctor's appointments or anything, 
know, if there's only one party that actually offers a plan, you know, we, we saw Therese Coffee this week and her plan was let's rely on volunteers. You know, it's not really much of a plan after all this time. So, you know, it's going to be running out of road, running out of time and ultimately no plan. And I think the absolute directionlessness approach you know, will start being seen very quickly. And you know, I think there'll be a lot of eyes on their party conference uh, next week to see what actually comes out of it. But at the moment, not a lot. And Rupa, is it the same for you in, in, in Reading West? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I'm glad that you chose two non-ex mining places. Yeah. You know, it's against the grain of what you think. I think Berry didn't, wasn't didn't the Tories put a tram line from Berry to uh, to Altrincham because that was the two Tory places always in the 90s when that first tram line came. And Reading West, I guess some similarities with my own seat. So I know about marginal seats. Actually, Chris and I both won our seats. So you do think very differently if you've not been gifted or parachuted a seat. You think in a different way. So, I mean, what I'm finding, I was at a 50th the other night. You can tell how old I am. It's the season of 50ths. People just think that they've gone completely bananas. The fact that, as Chris said, they've reneged on 12 years, not just 10, 12 years of policy where they were at the helm. She's been in the government all that time. And then they're sort of doing this crazy U-turn. I mean, I think in their leadership hustings, that question Rishi Sunak put to her, you've been a Lib Dem and you've been a Remainer, which one do you regret most? And I think he was being booed for being below the belt. I think that's entirely legitimate, that throughout her life she's done U-turns, and then this is a biggie, that they sort of trashed and burned everything they even said just months ago, budgets that they passed. It's interesting to see, though, that people are going to let her cut some slack. Let's see how it goes. And, I mean, I don't know, of the, of the 15 prime ministers that that last queen saw out, how many of those were Labour? Number? Anyone? Four. Four. Yeah, less than five. <laughs> Four. So that, I don't know, you're right that the Conservatives are this shape-shifting, election-winning machine. So many times in my lifetime I've seen when, you know, uh, Thatcher became unpopular. Suddenly she was replaced with John Major, who we forget won the biggest number of total votes to this day, I think. Surprise everyone. We thought, oh, this is this weak, grey bloke, we're going to walk it. And we didn't. So I slightly fear, I mean, all the indicators we're polling well, I think on current polling we'd have a majority of 56, but they've got 18 months to play with. Yeah. I think people, I don't know, but my neck of the woods now, so I won my seat from a Conservative in 15, Remain was very good to me. It, it was initially a majority of 274, then it went up 50 times in two years to nearly 14,000. I think we're not talking about Brexit, which um, any small business, any size business will know has been hugely damaging, the Brexit that we got. Um, but yeah, I would agree with everything Chris said, it's going in a pretty Trumpian direction on so many fronts, um, even I think her decision talking about moving the embassy to Jerusalem, like all this yeah. stuff she's doing, only Trump ever dared to do that. And that's the danger when you have an electoral system where you're preaching to a very small choir. Um, we all need to say, we need a general election. I mean, it goes without saying. So let's hope she does a Theresa May and calls an election. We're ready. And Joe, just a quick question around, I guess, you were speaking to ministers, conservative advisors, MPs last week and on Friday. Um, do they think this is insane? Are they, do they have the same emotional re reaction that Rupert, the city, global bond market seem to be having? Are they as frightened as some people are suggesting about the policy direction? Yeah, I think speaking to conservative MPs today and over the weekend, you have a split between those who backed Rishi Sunak, who feel very vindicated now. They feel like what is happening is proof that he was affected on the right side of the argument. And those who backed his, his trust are somewhat quiet at the moment and are hoping that they can improve. I think it's so interesting, James, from the clip you showed us how people are willing to give Liz Truss a chance. But we're rapidly seeing you know, that first impression be a pretty negative one when it comes to economic credibility. And I think the danger for the Conservative Party is that financial markets have reacted as they have, but interest rates, crucially, are on a path that will be punishing for those who have mortgages. And that's a very immediate financial harm that is effectively the first consequence of the Liz Trust government. So, if we're talking about can Labour win back marginal constituencies, 
uh, I think Labour's being helped significantly at this point by that, that policy direction from the Conservatives. Um, just a couple of things that I would add about marginal constituencies. I've travelled to many in my reportings. We try to tell the story of you know, what's the life of land, could Labour come back to power. I think three significant structural factors have changed which help Labour significantly going into the next election. You don't have to get Brexit done, which was probably one of the most successful election slogans ever. Mm -hmm. I remember arriving in a red wall seat and the Uber driver saying to me, someone who's not politically engaged, <coughs> just saying, we need to get Brexit done. And I was like, that is amazing, amazing to create an election slogan that people will voluntarily say to you without even being prompted. So that helps Labour, that, that's no longer uh, an issue. Boris Johnson is no longer part of the picture. Boris Johnson was incredibly popular on the doorstep across large swathes of the country. And also Jeremy Corbyn is no longer leader of the Labour Party and whatever your views are on him, he was a negative for many people. So you take those three huge structural factors out of the equation, that helps Labour significantly. But what I would say finally is a note of caution is that when I've gone to marginal constituencies, the view of Keir Starmer often hasn't been particularly infused on the doorstep amongst you know, your kind of run-of-the-mill run voters. I think if Labour is to win a solid majority, that attitude of somewhat apathy towards Keir Starmer has to be changed by the leader, and he has to energise in a way that he perhaps hasn't done so far. He's still got time before an election, but what I would say is that People would use the words like, he seems a bit smarmy, for example, or um, uninspiring. So yeah, that's something that Keir Starmer have to address. But as it stands, I think the structural factors are, it's looking quite good for Labour right now. I, I'd feel somewhat positive about the future. So Joe, you just set up our next video. <laughs> <laughs> so Joe, do you want to talk to me? Sorry, it should be gone. Thank you. Um, quite interesting listening to the three of uh, my colleagues. Um, as a leader of a large work authority, half a million people, uh, very diverse, um, we always think that we actually are going to win a big majority on the council and get more MPs. Um, you mentioned the uh, last 12 years of austerity, we thought great stuff, right? you know, the Tories were going to get hammered. They didn't. And we've got the pandemic, and we thought the Tories were going to get hammered. They didn't really get hammered, although Brexit was done. Uh, they still have ones that like, um, you know, come back. And then we think that the cost of living crisis is going to be the, 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 the saviour for Labour. But, but the bottom line is that markets have failed. Um, and one of the things that I've, I've seen the Tories do is, is step in quite, quite courageously uh, where markets are failing. But one of the things that they haven't done is actually how, how that market failure is going to then get compensated. Uh, what people haven't grasped, I don't think, is uh, people have to pay, the future generation <coughs> have to pay. Um, I, I, and, and that's where I think that we have to really make that mark. Because um, I was quite amused about uh, of the number of young people that were participating in your video. But, but how many young people have actually vote? How many do you actually engage? You know, they've got a lot of opinions. You know, I've got, I've got a daughter, I've got a son, uh, I've got two daughters. They've got opinions, but sometimes it's really, really difficult to get them to vote. So I, st I still think that we've got a big job to do. I still think that we've got a, a job to do in terms of, you know, not becoming complacent. You know, do not underestimate the Tories. You know, we keep on saying that. They've been in power for the best part of 300 years. And, and they're very, they are very, very ruthless. They are very, very good at actually getting people the leader. They're very good at creating a new narrative. And the other thing that I just want to finish on is there is a democratic deficit uh, across, the, across all, all, all nations, especially in the UK, uh, in England. And we've seen that for a number of years. So there will be something else that will fill that vacuum. And I think that something else needs to be the Labour Party. Uh, because there are still as many people that are feeling isolated and, 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 and completely pissed off with, uh, with all parties. And, and I fear that there's going to be something that, that might get created on the back of the cost of living crisis. And, and one way to do that is on the back of uh, immigration is a really good one. Um, uh, there's also sort of like other divisions that people can create. And I think that's where Liz Truss is heading down. She's doing it in a very careful, calculated way. But it's going to be interesting how we actually come to that. It's really interesting you say that, because I think one of the things we'll hear in a second when we hear voters asking questions about Labour is asking all the time, what's the plan? How is Labour going to deliver? And you know, that point you were making, Shabir, about you know, the Conservatives taking moments to intervene, to at least show that they might have a plan, perhaps, 
is something that we've heard back from the groups as well. So I wonder if James, you want to set up the second video and then we can get into a bit more of a conversation about labor. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've heard what the undecided voters had to say about this trust, and in some senses, they've got um, a kind of similar set of views on Keir Starmer. And th there's not a really strong sense as to um, who Keir Starmer is or, or of what he um, stands for. Um, I think at the moment, he's probably best known for attacking Boris Johnson over Partygate. Um, and uh, three months ago, that wasn't a particularly bad thing. But the problem is, it's kind of drowned out pretty much everything else that he's said over that time, um, to the point where few people in the focus groups could think of anything else that Keir Starmer had said or done recently, apart from um, Partygate. And the downside to that is that it, it makes him look like he's just throwing stones from the sidelines. Um, and so, as, as Joe said, and as, as we're about to hear um, in, in these groups, what they're really after um, is, uh, it, it, is something more like a plan. And I said, well, I've written down this week. Has he got a plan? Good, but falling a little bit short. Concepts. Not very vocal friendly. Not promising. Wants to take action. I really want to like him because he's, he's Labour. Um, but I just, there's a few words I've written down, but weak. He's not an opposition, he's a waste of time. He's absent most of the time. He misses several chances. He has no plans. Mm. Yeah, he's. I'm a bit concerned with the yes. Labour leader. I think he did himself a disservice when he got on the game for Boris because I felt like the only thing that he actually needs in his, you know, in his arsenal so much and he kept firing it and firing it over and over again was the party gate argument and it overshadowed anything mm -hmm. else that he could do. For me, his style does seem like he is authentic in what he's saying, but and he, he does act like, I think, ethically in some of the points he's saying. If someone said, what are the, what are Keir Starmer's three big priorities at the moment, would you be able to say what they are? Other than to be the Tory party. <laughs> yeah. We oh, don't, I couldn't tell you. We don't know what his targets are, because we, we just, well, I personally, and I think you said the same, is that I haven't heard them. I'm a bit, there's a floating vote, I suppose you'd call me, but I'd like to see someone stand up and say, this is the vision for the country and this is how we're going to do it. It's got to be, we'll listen to you, these yeah. are our policies, when we get in, this is what we're going to do, judge us on it when we get in. So that's what they're going to come out and be up front of people, which is the staff who's not doing that at all. We don't want to just keep hearing about all the problems that are, you know what the problems are. Yeah. Give us the solutions now. Do you have any sense as to what Neighbours' priorities are at the moment as a party? To bad mouths. It's basically to have a go at what they're doing, everything's wrong. I'm not part of the wrong. Yeah. Attack a different Great. Um, great. So, yeah, at the moment, obviously, these are undecided voters. By definition, they're sort of unconvinced by both Liz Trust um, and Keir Starmer. Um, but it's pretty clear what they want. They want uh, more clarity on policy, a stronger sense of purpose, and perhaps most importantly, um, that sense of a vision as to how the country would be different from Labour. So, I wonder if we could start, Rupa, you talked a bit about the journey you've been on in your seat, and you've built that over time. And I guess that required a pretty clear plan, actually. So what do you think the plan should be for Labour? I mean, you've heard that message really strongly, lots of different ways of saying the same thing. What's your view? Yeah, I mean, I think to some extent there was internal party issues that he had to sort out. Oh, is the microphone gone? Oh, it's that. Yeah, there was a sort of internal party stuff as well that he was dealing with, because you're right, there were really negative perceptions under the last uh, leadership. Um, you know, almost I found myself saying to voters, doesn't matter about the leader, you're voting for me, kind of thing. Um, I remember two elections I'd said, if you based it on leaders, look, um, Cameron, Ed Miliband, uh, Nick Clegg, they've all gone, but I'm still here, you know, don't do it on the leaders. Um, so there was a lot of washing of the dirty linen internally, the whole problems with anti-Semitism. So, I mean, I'd say his three things, that's been a very big one. 
we've got this Green New Deal, the promise of being the first Green New Chancellor, a uh, Green Chancellor ever. That's a good one. And then just general crumbling state of our public services and NHS. But I mean, the plan should be, Christian said it, on your side, that kind of thing, that this lot has just done a, bis a, a, a um, mini budget. It's not a real budget. It's a quasi quasi budget from qu quasi quasi. <laughs> But we know that, you know, things like um, bankers' bonuses are going to be uncapped. Like, all that stuff is a really bad look in a cost-of-living crisis. And cost-of-living crisis, I think Ed Miliband tried to go on. It didn't have as much traction in 2015. But when, I don't know, everything in the shop has doubled, tripled, quadrupled. You know, filling up your car, those kind of things. Although there's been some capping of the energy bills. Uh, I think we just need to present that on your side thing. I mean, the perceptions of him... Some of those played well against Johnson because he was boring, safe pair of hands, opposed to this flamboyant person who don't know how many kids he's got even. You know, all those things, the profligacy of the parties, wheeling suitcases of booze down Whitehall when the next day the Queen is burying her life partner of however many years. Um, yeah, that has gone. But I think we need to present him as someone competent, because he was a good contrast to Johnson, actually. That Johnson had too much personality. Um, he's gone. Liz Truss, I don't know what to make of her yet. I agree with some of those things that she's been in government all that time, but not really left any footprints or trace or done anything, apart from, you know, the pork markets and the cheese. That is a disgrace, those kind of things. I think we need to play on those, and, and I'm hoping the more people see Keir Starmer, the more they will like him. But, I mean, it, it's all note to self, isn't it, all this stuff? Uh, I hope the higher-ups are listening. <laughs> what do others think? Um, uh, Shabir, you know, I'm interested at a local level. You know, when you articulate your plan um, for, for the community in Kirklees, how much are the perceptions of the national leadership framing the way voters are engaging um, with the local authority and its Labour leadership? Yeah, um, actually, one of the things that came out, I'll, I'll answer that in a minute, but one of the things that came out from there was um, uh, both focus groups were focusing on policies, whereas in recent years we've seen lack of policies getting people elected. The other thing that came out from there was that these are undecided voters. Now, I don't know about how the panel were picked, but when I knock on a door and they say, oh, I voted all my life, I'm not going to vote for you, that means that they've never voted for us, I've been honest with you, because I've heard it that many times. Um, and if you knock on a lot of doors, you realise that actually, you know, some people will never get engaged, and they'll only get engaged when either one or the other extreme starts to make some noise, and they'll come out and vote. Um, and, and, and I saw that when, when George Galloway came and um, fought the recent by-election in, in back in Spain. And, and after that, they actually put some local candidates up as well at a local level. They didn't get anywhere, but people voted who would never, never have, have voted, and, and you know, there's something in there in itself. Uh, the, the other thing you talked about is the, the micro level. That's where we're at in terms of local authorities. Uh, and I would say this as a leader that you know we we actually the front line defence of, of a lot of public services, and unless you actually get that front line defence sorted out, and a lot of local authorities are run by Labour, they have got uh, uh, good Labour leaders. You know, we are the ones that actually got to pick up the skills um, agenda, we are the ones who have got to pick the education agenda, we are the ones who actually got to uh, uh, commit safety first, we are the ones who actually make sure that the environment's sound, we are the ones who actually build the, the houses, we are the ones who actually build the factories uh, to create the, the environment that we need. And unless we actually have a true partnership <coughs> with uh, our national party, uh, national leadership and, and local government, um, you're going to miss a trick um, because you know how, how do you how do you get that message from Keir Starmer and his team resonating down at a local level um, when you've got a local a lot of local council, a lot of local activists that can actually do a lot of legwork, um, <clears throat> and, and and it sounds very simple, but but to connect the macro economic uh, level to the micro level. Um, it is a must, and, and, and that's where I think that um, you know, in Kirkley we've actually now got a majority after oh, 30 years probably. You know, I've been on the council for 22 years, and I've, I've never known a Labour majority. We have a Labour majority, hopefully we're going to get a Labour majority again. Um, and I'd like to think that that's because uh, we've got a very clear plan in place. We've had 12 years of austerity, we've had the pandemic, cost of living crisis, 
but still we, we are investing 750 million pounds of, of council money into the council um, and, and, and there's still a lot more we can play on and, and I think that there's still some big ticket items that individual authorities can be bad with under the Labour umbrella uh, is how we actually understand that and get the message down. I can go on forever but I'll stop there. I guess finally, Christian, um, you know, this point, because it came across really strongly in the very groups, was just, negative is not the right word, but just really down in the dumps, and really uh, just a, a profound absence of optimism, and yet you're hearing at the same time, not necessarily that they want Labour to be Pollyanna-ish, but they do, do want a clear positive plan. How do, that's, a, that's a difficult, that's a difficult um, needle the thread if you like because there's a real danger that if you're not reflecting how people are feeling you can seem like you're on another planet so how do you think you balance that between yes times are tough but here's how we're going to change things what's your view on how, how that can be done oh i, I think rupa made a very important point uh, that actually a lot of energy over the last couple of years here has spent fighting internal battles uh, but in doing so that's meant he's now in a position uh, to start doing the external and, and start putting a uh, policy platform forward. So I, I remember my first meeting with Keir back on January the 16th, three days before crossing the floor, and obviously in Berry South, I've got one of the largest Jewish communities in the country, so part of my conversation was, what are we doing to tackle anti-Semitism? Because if, if I wasn't happy with that response, then you know, I, I knew walking into that door, but it was very much a, a when not if situation then and there's no going back. But if I wasn't happy with the response on anti-Semitism, then it would have been kiboshed. Um, so it, it was important to me, it still is, and it, you know, I was reassured to see that it was actually fundamentally important to Kia. Um, but I, I think we're, we're now at that precipice. Um, what was being said during the video was there's a lot of opposition, there's a lot of stone throwing from the outside. But we're now at that point with a second Prime Minister, and you know, people say about the opposition, but ultimately we got rid of Boris Johnson, uh, which is already an, an improvement in understanding for where we are. Love him or love him, he was a very effective campaigner. Um, but we now need to go from that opposition to a genuine <coughs> alternative. Uh, the, the resounding message from that video, and you know, I think we've seen it in, in the press, was what does Labour stand for? What does Keir stand for? I think we've started having soundings. You know, the, the cost of living policy that was finally adopted by the government after five months in June, you know, was a good start. You know, the, the fact that people were saying Liz Trust you know, had a cost of living uh, statement a couple of days after becoming Prime Minister, well, that's fine, but she basically did a, you know, a version of our policy, didn't go far enough, and you know, ultimately we were all still paying for it. Uh, so I think those policies are starting to come forward, but even here at conference, you know, we've had the launch of our industrial strategy. So what, we're, what our business approach is, we've had Rachel talk about how to actually have meaningful, sustainable growth invested in public services, because you can't have one without the other. Uh, but we're gonna be hearing about childcare, about housing, about health, because these things are fundamentally important to every single person we speak to, but more importantly, to young people who are ultimately wanting to you know, start families, get that first job, you know, leave university and actually have that hope that is so lacking at the moment. Uh, but I think arguably the, the biggest job that Keir's had so far, and I think he's come through with flying colours, is the, the approach of decency, of trust and respect. You know, mm -hmm. over my time in politics, you know, we've had you know, MPs' expenses, we've had Brexit, we've had COVID, we've had cost of living crisis, and politicians have never been viewed in such a low esteem. Yeah. Uh, so for Keir to ultimately put you know, his job, his career, his, his own personal ambitions on the line by saying, if, if, if I'm found guilty, I'll resign. Uh, I think that took a lot of guts and you know, that was a clear dividing line then between Keir and Boris and it paid off. You know, we, we ultimately did get rid of Boris, we now have trusts, or as I described it, the, the Braveheart candidates. You know, if you paint your face blue and shout freedom uh, a lot, you know, it seems to go down well with the members, but you know, the membership isn't the country. You know, we saw from the, 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 the Kamikaze budget uh, that actually it's just going to damage people. You know, there's no investment. It's you know, very good if you're a banker or earning over 150,000. But what are we doing for people <coughs> in Berry North or Berry South or Reading or Um, You know, there's so little being done and I can only see services getting worse because the only way they're going to fund it is through borrowing or, or 
more cuts. And you know, if if budgets are kept to you know some restrictions as we've seen in councils, you know, council and local government is going to be the first to cut. And there's so little left there that I almost see it as a a way to force local government reform by stealth, by making so many go bankrupt. They have to form larger unitaries and, and maybe even county-wide. But I, I think we, the negative perceptions have been addressed and the, even just, you know, first day of conference yesterday, you know, everyone was talking about how the view of singing the national anthem would be seen and the fact it went, the fact it went smoothly yeah. suggests that the party has fundamentally changed. Uh, and that's only for the positive. You know, so I think the, the personality level, that, that's already resolved. It's now, you know, we just need that policy platform and if, we, if we're if we thinking really hard about it, I think we're going to be leaving conference with quite a few, maybe not policies, but directions that people can clearly say what Labour stands for. And again, that, that we're on your side and, and more ultimately listening. Great, I think, you know, you've said a load of really interesting things there, Christian. I think a, a couple of you have mentioned um, the previous leadership. Um, it wasn't that he wasn't mentioned in the groups we ran, but he wasn't there as much as he, we thought we were. It was James. He was sort of like almost forgotten, but not quite. And I think that was very. T it was it was different to what we were expecting. Um, so we'll come on to talk about policy because Chrissy, you mentioned a few policies, and then Joe, I'll ask you to come in if if that's okay. I think we, we've asked we asked the groups a bit about SMEs. This being SME for Labour. Um, climate change and, and cost, cost, cost of living and energy policies. James, you just want to frame the video and then we'll have a look at it and then Joe will go to you. Yeah, and, and just, to, just on that point about the fact that um, the previous leader wasn't mentioned, that's often the case in these um, groups with uh, swing voters. They tend not to be following politics hugely closely, they tend to have very, very short memories. Um, so you don't bank what happened 12 months ago or two years ago with a, with a former leader in the way that you might expect. And that did come, you know, that, that was reflected in these groups too. Um, so as Joe said, this third segment is around the three policy areas, cost of living, business policy, and climate. Um, I'll play the video in a moment, um, but there's something in the video, or there's something not in the video, which I think is really important um, around the energy price cap. Now, I asked in the groups whether people understood the energy price cap and how it would actually affect them and a very small minority of people could could explain it um, and over the years I've done research for energy companies and it is really difficult to explain energy prices and how they work at the best of times but if you think about it the government has done a pretty ham-fisted job of explaining what the price cap is there's a lot of people out there expecting that energy prices can't go above £2,500 who are going to get a nasty shock at some point over the next um, six months or so. Uh, so I do think that's a real sort of hostage to fortune that the government has created around the messaging um, on, um, on energy prices. Um, so I'll play the video and then I'll, uh, I'll sort of summarise uh, where people stood on these three points. And what about this idea of there being a windfall tax on, on energy companies, on anyone who's making a really significant profit at the moment out of this? Are you in favour or against that? In Does anyone have a sense as to how much the energy price cap is forecast to cost the government. 1.5 billion, so 150 billion. Yeah, about, yeah. It, it's hard to know how long it's going to be, but 100 to 150 billion. <laughs> and we'll be paying that back for the next 100 years. But what's going to happen in two years' time? All this money that they're giving out, they're going to cost us back some money. Yeah, you know, so that's what's going to happen then. Yeah. Yeah. What types of businesses need support at the moment? Yeah. Who do you think is more likely to be on the side of, of, of smaller businesses, medium-sized businesses, Labour or the Conservatives? Historically, it's been Conservative, I think, right. over the years, I think, but I think don't believe that anymore. What about how businesses should be reacting to the cost of living crisis? It's like after a quarter of this essentials range, which, like, if you fill your trolley up like 40 pound, so things like that, I think, really important to people. Loyalty to existing customers. Being loyal to the people that like their staff already. How important a priority or not should be for the government? Should be, should be. I don't think you can wait any longer. I think even if it's not like a top, top thing, it certainly needs to be being addressed. Do you think overall we should be investing more or less or roughly the same sort of amount in climate change tackling it? 
hopefully with King Charles now, I reckon it's going to be a, that's going to be a massive, oh, yeah. massive yeah. boost, isn't it? If we're saying we got to dig more coal just to cover our own backs for the near future because Russia would suddenly turn the gas on, well, that's to me is the wrong approach. Mm -hmm. You've got to invest in renewables and all this sort of stuff, like the wind farms and all those sorts of things. We're an ideal country to have that sort of stuff. Um, great. So, but on cost of living, I think there are three things that um, our swing voters wanted. First of all, they want policies that make a real difference to living standards. And I said at the beginning, um, it's best to think of this as a living standards crisis and not a, a cost of living crisis. Um, so it's much bigger than just tackling um, inflation or interest rates. Secondly, I think they want fair policies. Um, and when you hear them talk, what they want is ordinary working people put first, um, which I think is probably not what they took from Friday's announcements. Um, but that idea of fairness is really important uh, to, to people. Um, and then thirdly, there is concern about how all of this government spending is going to be funded. Even two weeks ago, people were nervous about um, how long we'd be paying back um, the debt that the government had racked up during um, COVID and just with the energy price cap. Um, and so that, that idea of fiscal responsibility is really important to these sorts of voters, um, especially those, and there are a number in, in the groups who, who work as sole traders or who are um, small business owners themselves. Um, I don't think that Friday's budget would have ticked any of those three boxes from a, a swing voters perspective. I mean, I'd be fascinated to see what the polling focus groups um, shows us um, over the coming uh, days and weeks. Um, but I think the, the critical point as well to keep in mind is that growth, this idea of growth, is really abstract to people. And, and in focus groups, people don't really have a sort of strong sense or a strong view on what is good about growth. What, what isn't abstract is your elders and your relatives not being able to put the heating on over the winter. And, and that is another thing that the um, Conservatives can have to work really hard to show how the proceeds of, of growth, if there is any, are actually filtering through to people. Um, so then on business, I think um, SMEs uh, are seen to be struggling and larger businesses really aren't. Um, but um, ultimately what, what voters are, are looking for from the Labour Party is to be that, that voice of small businesses. There's a, and there's an opportunity there to do that because um, the Conservatives are very much tied in people's minds um, to large businesses. And then finally on climate change, um, there was a lot more of consensus on the need for action um, in these focus groups than um, used to be the case two or three years ago when you conduct groups with these sorts of voters in these sorts of constituencies. Um, and there's definitely an emerging openness, I think is how I describe it, to the idea of tackling climate change because it's good for energy security and it's in Britain's long-term economic interests. I think um, that's something that's shifted uh, in, in recent months. And you'd have heard some sort of perhaps relatively surprising voices in those groups um, positively behind um, in further investment in climate action. So I wonder if we could start, Joe, just with almost where that video started, which was a, started with a discussion of um, government spending. At least some of the groups could quote broadly how much the energy intervention was going to cost. Um, one of the things I just find fascinating about what happened on Friday is voters have been told for a really long time that you've got to balance the books. It was James Callaghan, not Margaret Thatcher, who ditched Keynesianism and said, um, you know, the rest of the world doesn't owe us a living. Every Prime Minister, every Treasury since then has, to varying degrees, said there's got to be fiscal rules, we've got to stick to them. And then the government dumped all that on Friday. Um, the books are now incredibly unbalanced. What's your view? Do you think that's going to work? You know, do, you think any, do you think voters can change, change what they've been, change the record as it were that quickly? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly major whiplash if you're a Conservative MP having to suddenly explain why what you said for 10 years wasn't correct. And that idea of fiscal conservatism was pretty powerful electorally. I mean, the 2010 general election victory for the Conservatives, 2015 as well, was effectively grounded on that as a philosophy. And if anything, I'd say it's created an opportunity for Labour now to say, to completely adopt that mantle and say, we are the party of sound public finances. And Richard Reeves in her statement her speech just now effectively positioned Labour in that way. I think it's a very wise thing to do. I mean, listening to uh, Pat McFadden yesterday, speaking about the approach the shadow treasury team is taking, it sounds to me like they are on the right track insofar as 
they acknowledge that Labour will always be known as the party that cares more about the NHS, cares more about public services. You do not need to go into an election as the Labour Party and have that as your mantra because you have won that argument. But the electorate will never believe the Tories care more about the NHS. The argument you need to win is that you can be trusted on the economy because that's why all those voters in that group are wondering, I'm not sure about Labour because you've had so many years of the Conservative Party saying these guys can't be trusted. So, and I just saw Keir Starmer speaking to some business leaders in the Bloomberg reception half an hour ago, and he said, we are going to go into the next election fighting on the economy. That's what we're going to go on. And I think, sounds like a pretty good idea, I think, because like I said, you, you have won the other stuff. So I guess the question will be, can Labour come up with enough economic policies to appear credible on that issue? And do they crucially have the message discipline to stick to that? and have every shadow minister on the broadcast round keeping to that very disciplined decoy message. If they do, you've got a good chance, I think, at the next election. Well, one of the things I was just thinking about is um, actually Kevin Rudd, when he was running to be Australian Prime Minister, standing at the Australian Labour Party conference and giving a speech where he said at one point, I am a fiscal conservative. Um, Christian, what's your view? Do you think Labour can say that, should say that, will believe, be believed by... People of Berry, what do you think? I was a fiscal conservative. <laughs> um, I, I, I think, like Joe said, you know, the public already trust the party when it comes to public services and NHS. The last thing I want to see in a general election campaign is a slogan of 24 hours to save NHS. Uh, it's been used so many times, people almost ridicule it. So, going back to Clinton, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, and, there is, there, there, and, and I'm clearly reading notes next to me now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's not rocket science. You know, if you've got a strong economy, you've got strong public services. Um, but going back to some of the arguments from, from the video, when people weren't able to explain you know, the cost of living support pack packages, I remember Rishi uh, you know, months ago you know, completely baffled as to why people couldn't explain it. And if you've got to explain it in an essay, you've lost the argument. You know, it, it's basically bullet points or, you know, this is the help you're getting as opposed to, well, you'll get this bit then, you'll get that bit there. You know, if you look in, you cross your fingers, you know, and, and you rub your tummy, whatever, you'll get a bit more money here. It just, it didn't make sense. It, it, I think he tried to do the windfall tax, but tried to change it as much as it could do, so it didn't feel like a, a Labour victory, despite the fact there was still going to be help. Um, but again, we have to remember, you know, it's it's still not capped uh, where it is now. From next week, it is still going up six hundred pounds. Um, so we, we do need to uh, try to emphasise the, the difference there. But when I've been speaking to former colleagues this week, yeah, you know, in fact, I'm not going to be the first person swearing in this chamber. Uh, but you know, the overall comment has just been it's batshit. Um, you know, they, they don't know what, you know what they're doing, they don't know what the approach is. Um, with the epic trolling from Liz Truss and making Jacob rees mock the face of the cost of living crisis, you know, what, what's there? Um, so when, when we go to support for business, like was mentioned in, in the video, where it's the hospitality sector, where pubs have been seeing their fuel bills go from 60,000 a year to over 400,000, even if it's halved like the package this week is suggested, that's still four times more than they were paying previously, and it's not affordable. Um, so it goes back to that, that, uh, that challenge, and uh, I was saying yesterday at a, a self-employed um, event, we need to have a party that will speak to, but more importantly, to listen and act on those concerns. It's not good enough, it's far too little, it's far too late uh, to be doing any of that. But when we look at the conservative approach, what they says so far in regards to the cost of living, learn to cook, get a new job, to work more hours, thank you, you know, I, I could have thought, thought of that myself, um, but it's not helping. Um, and then when we look at the environment, you know, again, there's a clear dividing line there. Liz Trust doesn't want renewables, she doesn't want solar farms, she doesn't want onshore wind because of, of the NIMBY lobby and you know, she wants to keep rural Norfolk, rural Norfolk. Um, but what are their solutions? Fracking? You know, I, I, I was a councillor in lecture, I remember those meetings. There is no public support anywhere in the country for fracking. We only need to see a government minister on question time this week saying, oh, I'm in favor of fracking, just not in my seat. <laughs> well, thanks, Brendan, but whose seat do you want it to be in? You know, it's, again, it's just so far detached from reality. 
that I don't even think they believe what they're saying themselves. So how are the country going to? Uh, so they've already set the narrative, but we need to show those dividing lines are there. Um, it is a policy-driven one. It is an ideological one. But we can win that argument. We need to win that argument, and we will win that argument. Great. We've just got a couple of minutes left, but Shabir, uh, Rupert, I'm just really interested in, in on, particularly on these issues like climate change that I think are traditionally seen when, you know, you said it's the economy stupid. Um, one of the things we were struck by in the groups is that is that on climate change there was a degree of commitment that perhaps we've not seen before, just locally in, in your constituency and in your local authority. Those issues that might have been seen as second order, do you think they're part of the economic debate now? If you ask it, the Joe public about climate, I mean, obviously they're not really interested, seriously, um, because uh, the constituents I represent, they've got to go to work, they've got a two litre diesel, 10 years old, and they cannot afford to change that to electric vehicle, they just can't, especially because of the cost of living crisis. Um, the other thing I want to quickly mention is um, that the plans don't go far enough because we, we mentioned, uh, or somebody mentioned to me earlier this week, that we, we, we're on in, we need intensive care, we're on life support, um, the markets are failing, and, and that's why everything's gone out of the window, and that's why the markets are behaving the way they are because the normal rules of engagement and doing business have actually gone out of the window. And that's why I think the, the Conservatives are qu quite bold and courageous. And I think, my personal view is, that they're, they're testing the water though. Because a lot of the people I'm talking to say, oh yeah, great, we're going to get task cut, we're, we're going to get national insurance like, reversal. And, and, and these things resonate with the public, although they might not understand. It, it's around, it's around um, psychology, it's about perceptions. Um, and I don't think what they've put in the budget is enough to actually get us through because the measures that are there are three to six months, they're reviewing, they expect business to actually put some kind of uh, energy efficiency plan um, to reduce their, 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 their prices, maybe expectation management, um, because unless things change at an international and national level, I can only see things getting worse. And that's why I, I really think that we need to actually be a lot more bolder. And by being bold, we need to say that actually this is going to be paid through uh, energy companies and all the big multinationals. Um, and that's where I think it will carry the people with you. Because I've been around for quite a bit. I used to work in local government and NHS. And seeing the, the way people are striking, seeing the, the way people are actually fighting for the living standards. Uh, we've got um, a pay ballot out for uh, local government and public sector workers. I don't know what's going to happen there. The, the package that have, has been provided is it, it, quite reasonable, although it's, it's not enough. Um, I, I really believe that people actually want hope, but hope in a way that we've never seen before. And I, I, I really think that the Tories are onto something. They're just testing the water, though. Um, you know, for Tories to do what they did, throw the rule book out of the window, it's unbelievable. They, they, they have something else behind the scenes. They've got another plan. <coughs> behind the scenes, they're just testing how things could work. Yeah, two very striking things from the findings in the video is I think green issues have ceased to be a bit of an anoraki thing. They used to be a bit of a fringe intellectual type of argument. And so certainly in the 2008 crash when that happened, before then you had Cameron as leader of the opposition who was in his hugger husky phase. Uh, he was going to be the greenest prime minister ever. And then we had the uh, remarks that he was making off record of cut the green crap yeah. once. That, so it was seen as a luxury thing that you can dispense with, whereas I think those focus groups show. And you said, Shabir, that the average Joe doesn't give a monkey's, I think, or doesn't rate it highly. I think that's a generational thing as well, right? So our children, you know, that generation... I don't want change. I don't want to change. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I know we're all on the right side, but I think it's also maybe a generational thing, the school strikes, the Greta generation, all those people. But it is filtering through. Everyone on those things said it's not being taken seriously. We've only got one planet and all that stuff. So, I mean, this uh, pledge this week that Rachel Rees will be the first Green Chancellor ever, the Green New Deal, I think that is all stuff that um, we should be enthusiastic about. Also, the types of businesses that they were saying will be clobbered. They all said small business, didn't they? And you know, I'm a child of small business. My dad had Indian restaurants, one first, at one time he had two, and then they were victim of an earlier recession sort of thing. Um, 
But, I mean, there are micro businesses. There are ones where it's one or two people. And those kind of things, again, it doesn't speak to them at all. People who literally will starve, put everything into the business plan and never go on holiday. Those small business people, there's three million excluded. The self-employed who have no government support, they weren't in any of the Rishi packages. I think those are people that we should harness and we should look about doing something for them. Uh, I think there were 19 suicides amongst this three million excluded category. It's heartbreaking when you meet with them. So, um, also, you mentioned el your elderly relatives, what's happened to them? What's happened to the social care levy? One of Johnson's big flagship things is he's going to sort out social care, and you'll know as a council leader, it's the biggest item of expenditure on any uh, local government budget. We've, we're back to square zero, that there's no plan for that. We have an ageing population. All that demographic disaster is coming down the track. So, yeah, it is the economy, stupid. But we need to do it in a fair and balanced way. We need to show people we're on your side, that lot aren't. Um, and, and one other small thing that I didn't say earlier is that in the focus groups, people were saying that Kirstan has just been seen as a tacky, particularly over the um, party gate stuff. I think the hand he was dealt with, first of all, we had COVID. People, I remember being on Zooms with him and, you know, even I was saying, when are the gloves going to come off? Because our, our members want to see a more oppositional approach. But at that time, I was told that in a moment of crisis, people want to see consensus. They don't want to see Rah! attacking the government because it's a moment that we pull together. Same with Ukraine. We've had an identical position on that. So sort of some of these big issues, you know, we've had so many huge things in the in-tray, um, you know, plagues, freak weather, the whole lot, haven't we? War. Uh, no one's, you know, a week is a long time in politics. I think someone was saying that their newborn baby has already seen two monarchs and two prime ministers in his short life. So, you know, where it goes, who knows? But, I mean, I think if we continue, continue showing that he's a, you know, safe pair of hands, that we've got the policies that go with it, we can totally do this. Great, well, I think that feels like we're just coming up with time. That feels like a great way to end, not least because those points around Labour and the opportunity to be the partner for a small business is exactly why SME for Labour's uh, here and doing all the great work it's doing at the conference. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you so much to the fantastic panel for being part of the conversation today, and thank you to SME for Labour for putting, putting the event on with us. So we'll just say thank you very much.